one of the memorable moments in seminary for me was in preaching class when one of my fellow students uh, raised his hand and said, Prof, I got a question. How many points should a sermon have? Should it have one point, two points, five points, six points, three points? How many points should a sermon have? And the professor wisely said, well, it should have at least one. And that's right. It should have at least one. And normally, I think it should have only one. And so when we study the Bible to teach the Bible, what we are looking for as we study is, what is the main big idea of the text? What is the main big idea of the text? I'm watching a series of videos on preaching these days, and the teacher, Brian Chapel defines expository preaching th- th- this way. The meaning of the text is the message of the sermon. The meaning of the text is the message of the sermon. And that's talking about an expository sermon. And, and it is true of a, a, a topical sermon as well, as well, that the meaning of the text, the passage itself, is what we want to communicate. And I ought to be able to stop you before you walk into class on any given, se- given day and say, what are you going to teach your people t- today? And you ought to be able to say in one sentence, today I'm going to teach my people about this, that, or the other. And if I were to interview one of your students when you get done and say, what was the lesson of your class today? Any one of your students ought to be able to say, today we talked about how we can sin less than we do. Today we talked about how can we can sure, be sure that we'll go to heaven when we die. Today we talked about how we can pray effectively. Whatever the topic is, your people ought to clearly understand what you clearly intend to, intended to communicate to them. A great illustration of this is found in the book Made to Stick, and I highly, highly, highly recommend this book. And I'd like to read you a little section from the uh, uh, section on simple and uh, make a couple of applications as we go along. Every move an army soldier makes is preceded by a staggering amount of planning. And it reminds me of all the, the study that you're going to do as you study the Bible in order to teach the Bible. And there's a great deal of word studies and theology studies and commentary studies and cross-references and so on, so on, so on. And there's a great deal of study just as there's a great deal of planning involved in, in moving an army which can be traced to an original order from the President of the United States. The President orders the Joint Chiefs of Staff to accomplish an objective. The Joint Chiefs of Staff set the parameters of the operation. Then the orders and the plans begin to cascade downward from generals to colonels to captains. The plans are quite thorough, specifying the scheme of maneuver and the concept of fires that each each unit will do what equipment it will use, how it will replace the munitions, and so on. The order snowball and snowball and snowball until they accumulate enough specificity to guide the actions of one individual foot soldier at a particular moment in time. The Army invests enormous energy in planning, and and its process has been refined over many years. The system is a marvel of communication. There's just one drawback. And the drawback is the same drawback you have as you teach your class, particularly if you teach, as I recommend you teach, using a question and answer approach. I believe we are changed more by what we say than what what we hear. And when we get people to speak the truth, they are changed by the truth they speak. And I believe you ought to teach using a question and answer approach. But if you teach using a question and answer approach, what you'll find is that oftentimes, People will get you off topic. They'll get off the subject. They'll uh, chase rabbits and go here and go, go there. And it's just like in the, in the army, they say, plans, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So a teacher would say, no plan, no lesson preparation survives contact with the class. And so what are we to do? Well, this colonel says, over time, we've come to understand more and more about what makes people successful in complex operations. He believes that plans are useful and preparation and study is useful in the sense that they are proof that planning has taken place. The planning process forces people to think through the right issues. But as for the plans themselves... They just don't work on the battlefield. So in the 1980s, the Army adapted its planning process, inventing a concept called the commander's intent. The commander's intent. And it was one solitary sentence that would say, our goal is to take 
this mountain. Our goal is to take this beach. Our goal is to get these people in this area. And in a similar way, as you teach, you would do well to focus your attention. And as you study, you want to ask, what is the main big idea of the passage? And what is the one thing that I want to try to communicate to, to, to my group? And if we get off topic and if we chase some rabbits and we discuss this and we discuss that, maybe you ought to discuss those, some of those things. You ought to have a clear understanding. Today, we want to teach thus. I remember a year or two back, I was uh, uh, teaching and and uh, I'm heavily dependent on PowerPoint. PowerPoint is pretty much my notes when I, when I, when I teach. And so uh, I was uh, uh, teaching away and all of a sudden my computer just died. I mean, just died dead. I went out that afternoon and bought a new one and it, it died dead and I had nothing to say. But I'll tell you what I did have to say. I did have to say, folks, this is what I fundamentally had to, uh, came to, to say to you today. And I want to try to illustrate it this way. And I want to make this application and that good teachers do that. They have a central focus in their teaching. This is not only my opinion, this is the opinion of smart people. And I'll read you some quotes from some of these smart people. The older three-point sermon style should be abandoned in this hard-hitting day of single-emphasis communication. This is not to say, however, that the sermon outline might not have several peers that support the argument. It is just that these points of supporting logic should not be allowed to develop separate themes. They should all contribute to building a single emphasis which the sermon or the Bible study lesson develops from the lone theme it champions, that from Calvin Miller. When I began my ministry, my problem was that my sermons had too many ideas and illustrations. So many sermons. It's like we read verse 1, talk about it a little bit, read verse 2, talk about it a little bit, read verse 3, talk about it a little bit, read verse 4, talk about it a little bit, and then we say, may, may God bless the, the, uh, the, the study of God, God's Word. No, we ought to have a single clear focus. I want to teach my people how to win over worry. I want to teach my people to be givers. I want to teach my people to be uh, servers. I want to teach my people to be ready for Christ return. Whatever the topic of the day is, we want to have a singular focus around this. And this preacher says he didn't do that as a verse. Those sermons lacked focus and development. I mistakenly thought that I had to keep people interested in my sermons. I had to fill them with as many clever points, uh, uh, insights, and stories as possible. Those poor people. And a good sermon has focus and a good Bible lesson has focus. And as you study the Bible to teach the Bible, you need to ask yourself constantly the question, what is this single one big idea of, the, of this passage. This week I'll be teaching on doctrine. And I'm, the big idea is doctrine matters. Truth matters. Sincerity is not enough. It is not enough to say, well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you, you are sincere. Doctrine matters. It may not be sexy. It may not be interesting. You may not be as, as thrilled with it as some other kind of teaching, but it is going to matter to your eternal destiny uh, what your doctrine is. That will be the single focus, and that kind of single focus helps me in my preparation, and I think it helps the people as they li listen th this week. Uh, Haddon Robinson said, a sermon should be a bullet, not a buckshot. A sermon should be a bullet, a single focused idea, a single solitary idea that as you study, you ask, what is the meaning of the text? And that will be the message of my lesson this week. One more. Ideally, each sermon, each lesson, each Bible teaching is the explanation, in interpretation, and application of a single dominant idea supported by other ideas, all drawn from one passage or several passages, but there's one single dominant idea that drives the whole thing. Uh, David, David and John Ferguson wrote, we have bombarded our people with too many competing little ideas. Don't do that, teacher. Don't bombard your people with a million little ideas. Have one single focused idea that I want to try to communicate to my people. And the result is a church with information and less clarity than perhaps ever before. One more, the meaning of the passage is the message of the sermon. The meaning of the passage is the message of the sermon. And so as you prepare to study the Bible in order to teach the, the Bible, you want to ask, what is the single big idea of this passage that I want to communicate to my people this week?